Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. We turn now in our Roberts text to page 775, uh, Nicholas Ranotti's Sports March from 1944. There are a few poems that we will study together in 303 that are as difficult to study and to read as this poem. And so I want to begin by just pointing that out. Uh, our dates here for Rinaldi, 1909 to 1944. It's the 1944 that we're going to pay most attention to in a moment. He is a great Hungarian poet as well as teacher. But it will be the note on page 775, the footnote, that will set us up to this study so powerfully. I'll just read these words with you. In the, la in the late days of World War II, Allied troops advanced into Germany from all directions. Because there were many prisoners in concentration and work camps, in countries around Germany, the Nazis determined to hide the evidence of any atrocities. They therefore forced their prisoners, who were given little if any food, to endure agonizing marches to camps in and near Germany, distances of hundreds of miles. Evacuating the Boer area of Yugoslavia in September 1944, the Germans forced a large number of Jewish laborers, one of whom was Ranaldi, to walk to Hungary. Forced March is one of his ten last poems. And in it shows his reaction to the march, and at the end of which he tragically was shot to death and thrown into a mass grave. The poem was found in a small address book in the pocket of his raincoat after his body was exhumed in 1946. Your text will also reference uh, Cynthia Orsic's uh, The Shawl, um, on page 260, a text we've already worked with, and of course we'll immediately think of our study of Ila Weissel and, uh, and, and uh, Knight. Let's now turn to the text itself. Um, we've got a translation by Orsbeth and Turner. Um, notice the poem will begin with recognizing this is for the 15th of September, uh, 1944. Force March. Crazy. He stumbles, flops, gets up and trudges on again. He moves his ankle and his knees like one wandering pain. Then sallies forth as if a wing lifted him where he went. And when the ditch invites him in, he dare not give consent. And if you were to ask, why not? Perhaps his answer is, a woman waits. A death more wise, more beautiful than this. Poor fool, the true believer, for weeks above the roofs, but for the scorching whirlwind, nothing lives or moves. The house walls lying on its back, the prune trees smashed and bare. Even at home, when dark comes on, the night is furred with fear. Ah, if I could believe it, that not only do I bear what's worth the keeping in my heart, but home is really there, if it might be. As once it was, on a veranda, old and cool, where the sweet bee of peace would buzz, prune, marmalade would chill, late summer stillness sunbathe in gardens half asleep, fruit sway among the branches, stark naked in the deep. Fanny waiting at the fence, blonde by its rusty red and shadows, would write slowly out all the slow morning said, but still it might yet happen. The moon so round today, friend, don't walk on, give me a shout, and I'll be on my way. Now there are of course few poems that are as tragic in their rendering of what we might call a poem of death and hope, a poem of longing and yet desperation, we might say. Right away, let's jump, though, to level 2B, rhetoric. Not what Radnoni has to say, but how it is, in fact, said. Notice, we will have these breaks right in the middle of the line. Uh, we will call them later uh, in our discussion at 3A. This is sure, of course, we'll be thinking about our study of the Exeter book, our study of the uh, seafarer and the wanderer, um, as both of those will play games. This is a very old way to think about creating lines and line breaks. And the understanding that we're going to um, emphasize certain kinds of things 
as we work. Notice the first word is crazy, right? And right away, it sets somewhat the tone. Notice the stumbling, the flopping. We have any number of texts that will come to mind uh, that will play similar kinds of games to try to express what desperation looks and feels like. Notice the verb trudges in the first line. Notice the word perhaps at, uh, at line 5, which will tie in at the very end, at line 1920, that it still might happen. The fallibilist epistemological position, that is to say, maybe there's some hope, maybe there is some reason to look forward. But then notice the declaration of poor fool, the true believer. And then the idea of what might be waiting, if possible. We have this juxtaposition of the horrors of the realities of what probably is waiting. And then the hope that maybe, maybe there is peace that would buzz. The sweet bee of peace that would buzz. Of course, in the end, the hope that maybe he'll get to see the girl. Notice the repetition of the word home several times being used in this poem. The moon so round today will finish the poem. Friend, don't walk on. Give me a shout and I'll be on my way. The expectation. Notice all of the exclamation points at the conclusion of the poem. And of course, if we're now working at level 2A, obviously the major message here is the longing, the longing for some kind of ending of the pain. The senseless, the insane pain, right? And the possibility of hope, even in the midst of dark anguish, dark desperation. We've already said it to be the power of the breaking in these lines. Also, of course, the symbolism of home and the longing for home. At 3A, well, obviously we've said already that this uh, poem works so powerfully well with texts like um, Eli Vessel's Night, um, as well as texts, as we said, from the Exeter book, the seafarer, especially the wanderer, our study of the wonder, plays around with these line breaks, these seizures as well. Finally, at 3B, what is a time in your life when you had to get through a forced march to use the symbolism of this poem? That is to say, you had to hope to find some way to survive. I do uh, hope that our study here of Renoni's poem will lead you on to some of those poems that were written tragically at the very end and found tragically after our poet's death. Thank you.